this is our seventh video, and today we're going to look at language as a way of knowing. So language, okay, like so many of our other ways of knowing, uh, works in conjunction. It, it can't stand alone. You need you know, something else to work with language, but they can work together to create knowledge. And so it's one of the many ways we can acquire, we can bring in new knowledge. Uh, language allows us to break out of our small circle of experience, just our own experience, to tap into the collective experience of humanity, in that I can talk to other people, I can listen to other people, and gain new knowledge beyond what I would be limited by if I just stuck with myself. And so this allows me to go beyond myself. It's not a perfect form of communication, however, there's no perfect form. And a person can mean one thing when they speak, but this may not be what the other person understands when they actually hear it. And so there's that disconnect that I can say one thing and you may hear another thing. And that's the difficulty of communication, this exchange of information by speaking, writing, or some other nonverbal means. And so it doesn't just have to be speaking. It can be uh, via books is language. And there are many ways to communicate, but uh, all these ways, there is a flaw. There's no perfect communication where I'm going to perfectly understand exactly what another human being is going to say, and that we don't have this automatic link between each other. So what is language? Well, there's a couple ways to define it. One to start with is that language has to have rules. Uh, some examples of the rules of language in that we have grammar, and these are the rules for constructing meaningful phrases and sentences out of words and that different languages will have different grammar rules as far as the order of things, as far as it should be, is it a adjective, a then noun, or noun, then adjective? What's the order of the words in your language? And that's going to make sense in that language, in that the order of words in English is not the order of words in Spanish. Is it a happy cat or cat happy? Um, for example, Jill hit Jack. We know Jill is the hitter and Jack was hit. That just makes sense for our grammar. In the case of English, it's noun before verb. That's the subject. That's what we're talking about. That's somebody that's in action. Versus noun after verb. That's the object. That's something that was acted upon. And so just the order, Jill hit Jack. Hey, we can tell a lot of what happened just on the order of things. Vocabulary also has its own arbitrary rules, and then most words feel like they naturally fit to us, even if it is very specific to a single language. Dog makes sense to English speakers, while Quan makes sense in Chinese. And here's some examples as far as a, what a dogs sound like in different languages. Uh, and when it comes to what does woof, well, we say woof in English, but in Russian it's gav, in French wow. Uh, and these all make perfect sense in those languages, uh, but it just doesn't make any sense in English. And it's just what we're used to, and so that's kind of one of these difficulties of vocabulary. One issue is language is intended, and that you have to actually want and, and have an intention here. That all language is communication because it's intended, but not necessarily all communication is language. Example, body language is the tricky one in that you can make body language as far as I can yawn, I can do a fake yawn and to say that I'm bored, and that would be me communicating that I'm bored. But if I'm actually yawning and I didn't mean to yawn, that's not language. And so that's the tricky thing in, in body language is it, it, it can be both and that it can be intended that I cross my arms on purpose to show I don't want to listen to you or it can be unintentional and that's probably not language. And so there there has to be intent for it to count and that you're attempting to communicate. In the case of body language, sometimes that is an unconscious attempt and that the back of your head says, I don't want to listen, so I'm going to cross my arms. And there, there's a bit of debate there as far as uh, is, is intent necessary for language, especially what is intent if it's an unconscious thing. It is creative and it's open-ended 
in that the rules of grammar and vocabulary allow for the creation of an infinite amount of grammatically correct sentences, and that we have basic rules for these equations of language, and we can add in any amount of words forever, and it will still be grammatically correct, because we just have basic formulas for that language. And new words are constantly created, and that the language is shifting so that we can barely understand a lot of what Shakespeare said 500 years ago, it's almost impossible to understand what the English were saying a thousand years ago or two thousand or 1500 years ago, I should say, and that English is a rather young language. And so we create new words. Shakespeare created tons of new words because he wrote quite a lot. And so dwindle, frugal, obscene, these are all new words that he comes up with. And here's a giant list of just words that are idioms and phrases that we say now all the time, because Shakespeare made them common. Uh, foreign words are added all the time if we don't have our own word for it. So algebraic uh, is Arabic. Is Arabic. Uh, kindergarten is German. Uh, rendezvous is French. And these are all common English words now that we just didn't have a word for it. So we're going to throw it in and absorb it. And English is very good at absorbing other languages so that we are just this mishmash of so many other languages. We are a Frankenstein language. The problem of meaning, again, this is the issue of language, and I can mean one thing and you're going to hear something else. What distinguishes meaningful words from meaningless words? A couple different theories as far as how we can figure out the meaning of a word, as far as I mean this. One theory is just the pure definition. The meaning of a word is best found in the dictionary. And that I'm saying cat, so you're going to look up cat. And the issue of the dictionary is sometimes there'll be multiple definitions. The definitions are going to be vague or imprecise. And by using words to define words, you're going to just get away from reality and get stuck into that dictionary where the issue is you're just going to start to think about words and move away from the reality where, hey, no, no, the conversation's about this cat I'm talking about. And you are looking up definitions of mammals. And now you're looking up definitions of animals, and now you're looking up definitions of species with backbones, and you've got off track. I'm just talking about cats. Denotation theory, the, the idea that meaningful words have to correspond to real things. And so if it's not real, substantive, and I can't touch it, uh, then it's not really a, a simple thing and meaningful thing. And so abstract words are not things that are very difficult to explain. So that's the issue of denotation theory is how do you explain love? How do you explain freedom? Because I think they are meaningful, but they're not necessarily things that I can hold. Image theory, uh, this is the meaning of word. That's the mental image that it stands for as far as exactly what's going to pop in my head when I say freedom. It's probably not the word freedom. It is a specific image of, of a flying eagle. And that's what's coming in my head. So that's the image theory as far as what's in your head when you say that word. That's probably the closest you're going to get to your meaning for that word. So when I say freedom, I'm thinking eagle. Uh, the critique is, well, I'm saying freedom, but you may not have an eagle automatically flying into your brain. And so we can never know if someone else is exactly understanding my interpretation of freedom there. And then another way to look at it is meaning is know-how is that meaning is an acquired skill. It's not a thing to be found, and that you'll, you'll be able to understand more as you acquire more education, more knowledge, and that it's something you can do. Problems of meaning. Uh, five major issues. Let's take a look at five issues when it comes to the problems of meaning in everyday language. One, vagueness, in that meaning depends on context. Fast or slow is incredibly relative. If walking fast versus driving fast are very different speeds. And so that's to say go fast is incredibly vague. And it's, it's very relative on the situation. Ambiguity, uh, this can lead to multiple interpretations. I can't bear children. Uh, that could mean either I don't like children or I cannot physically give birth to children. So that's an ambiguous statement and that there's different ways to in interpret it there. My meaning can go in different directions. Secondary meaning in that we've got two little explanations here. 
One connotation, the ideas and associations a word evokes, in addition to its literal meaning. Death tends to be a negative and have negative connotations, and the death tends not to be a positive thing. And so I'll say death, and you've already added words onto it. Euphemism, this is a softer, a softer sounding word or phrase used to disguise something unpleasant. I don't want to say that your uncle died, so I will say your uncle passed away. It's a softer hit in this little cartoon, the mutt. We don't want to say mutt, now we're going to say hybrid. It sounds better. Uh, continuing with our look at five issues. Uh, metaphors. This is a figure of speech which makes a comparison between two things. And so we can see metaphors all the time uh, as far as uh, something's like a rose uh, or as sweet as a rose. Uh, irony. This is a figure of speech in which words are used to say one thing and mean the opposite. So bits of sarcasm or these fun little images here. Lots of different forms of irony, but it's a big idea where you're saying one thing, but you're meaning another. And that's that major issue of language is you're saying one thing and meaning another. And so irony is one of the great examples of I'm saying one thing, but I'm meaning another, but I'm trying to do both at the same time to show you an issue. And so this safety one with the bus or the train hitting the car, safety begins with you. It's, it's supposed to be funny because it's ironic, because it's saying we're going to be safe and here they're not being safe. Nothing's written in stone, but except for that thing. And so it's showing that contradiction, the, the problems of meaning. Uh, so we're talking about all the different languages. Well, what about issues of translation? There are about 3,000 languages on this planet, but they are disappearing fast. As we communicate more and more, the tiny languages are dying out as people try to tend to go to whatever the most common language nearby is. And so piece by piece, we are losing languages at an alarming rate as the more people will speak. English, French, Chinese, Spanish, they're going to lose their local languages. And we have a major issue that, with that in America. As far as uh, Native American languages are dying at an alarming rate as people are going to get educated in English schools instead of Hopi schools or Cherokee schools or whatever, and they lose the language and it dies out over time. So let's look at the issues of translation. Problems of translation. It, Three major issues here. One, context, in that the meaning of a word is often relation to the other words. So uh, chat, discuss, talk, gossip will often have slightly different meanings in different languages. So they're not going to match up exactly. And having a word right next to another word will often change that meaning. In many cases, there are words that just don't translate into any other language and that there's no single word to translate it. So we're going to have to really explain it out. Uh, and have a full paraphrase or a sentence to explain exactly what that one word means. My favorite is schadenfreude, and this is taking joy in others' pain. Your friend falls down and you laugh at them. Schadenfreude. Uh, schadenfreude, that's very German, okay? but we just don't have, an, we don't have a singular word for it, but it's something you've probably done, my horrible people. Idioms, uh, these are colloquial expressions, whose, or joyful expressions, uh, funny expressions whose figurative meaning cannot be deciphered from its literal meaning. And so a perfect storm. That's when everything comes together. Okay? But the, it, it, how do you translate that? The idea that everything comes together into perfect storm. That's not the literal translation. That's just a, a little thing that we say. And so it's not easy to translate that into other languages because it's not a literal definition. So what makes a translation reliable? One, is it faithful? Is it true to the original text? As far as this is saying this, but if you do a literal translation, so in case of a laughing at others' pain versus schadenfreude, it's not the exact same. There's not an exact word for it. And so are you sticking to what the original, the original meaning? Not necessarily the literal translation, but the, what is the intent? And then comprehensibility is, is it understandable? Does it work together? Does it make sense? And so do we go with the meaning and does it make sense in the new audience? You have to find in many cases a balance. So good translation is a difficult thing in that we're balancing out meaning and 
the ability to make sense in a different language. And so one way to kind of solve that, and so here are some funny little signs where they have horrible translations. Speaking cell phone is strictly prohibited when thunderstorm. Uh, that is probably faithful to the original language. It's probably a literal translation from the Chinese, and it makes sense in Chinese grammar. It does not make sense in English grammar. Back translation. So to kind of fix these issues, we would translate from English to Chinese and back to English. And if it lines back up, and so I translate something into Chinese and then back into English, if it correctly goes back into English with the exact same words, that's probably a good translation. Uh, but that's one way we can play with that to test it out, is back translation. Labels and stereotypes. So how does language affect the way that we see the world? Well, one is labels, in that we're going to label things. This will allow us to predict things. As far as I see that thing, and I'm going to call it Apple. And now anytime I'm thinking of Apple, I should be able to say, okay, Apple, I know what that is. It's crispy, it's crunchy, it's sweet, it's got a little sour. That's an apple. And I have now labeled apples, and anytime I say apple, you're going to understand that meaning. The risk is we can mislabel things when only looking at certain factors. Um, carbon monoxide, it's, you can't see it, it's just like CO2, and so to say that something, that a gas that is not visible is just as good as another gas that's not visible, no, that'd be pretty dangerous, because carbon dioxide, hey, probably bad, but carbon monoxide, definitely bad, and so just labeling things based on one factor can be a little dangerous there. Are labels natural or are they cultural? It depends on your arguments. As far as, hey, is this something that all humans do or do certain cultures have certain labels? And this can lead to things like stereotypes and racism where we oversimplify and label usually a negative picture of an individual or group based on their membership of that group. And we are labeling them on one aspect based on one lie and it just spreads out. And so that's kind of the danger of labeling, where we're expecting that a one person is representative of the entire issue, and that's the issue of labeling, is a one will not necessarily represent the whole. Language and thought. Uh, the sphere wharf hypothesis is the claim that the language you speak influences or determines the way you see the world, and that Spanish speakers are going to think differently. German speakers are going to think differently. So some examples, uh, the one that always pops up is Inuits, uh, that there are so many words for snow, so many more words for snow. Well, they might have 50 words for snow as far as soft snow. So it's not just snow, it's descriptive words. Uh, soft snow, wet snow, a cold snow, a less cold snow. So they'll have all these different things as far as words for snow. And so they, they're looking at it in a different way or as far as the Hopi language, has a very different concept of how time is. And so different concepts of what snow is, different concepts of what time is across languages. These are not just one word that's untranslatable, but it's a whole pattern that is. And this is the idea of linguistic determinism. The idea that it, well, our language and its structures limit how we are able to think about things. Uh, one big experiment the idea that they, and then we've done this with uh, bilingual people, where we'll give them two different surveys on two different days, and in many cases, and one survey will be in one language, one survey is in another language, and the surveys in different languages, you get different answers, because they may be thinking differently. According to English, they'll think in one way, in Japanese, they may think in another way. Some critiques of linguistic determinism uh, is the idea that it's not language influencing you, perhaps it's the world influencing language, and that, yeah, Inuit people, they see more snow than I do, so I understand why they have more words for it. They also have, there's also issues that maybe we don't even need language to think, and that babies can be, they, we've done experiments with babies, so that they have been able to do simple math, Ideas can come in images, and then we later on have words to them. Uh, no, that's not what I meant to say. This shows that, well, you had an idea, but you had a thought before the words could connect. And so maybe thoughts are coming before words. And new words are coming up all the time. And so 
there are many cases where we're thinking before the word even exists. And so it's possible to think without this. Uh, language is valid, so we're using language to influence and persuade so that we have a propaganda. Uh, so we'll have emotional language, so we'll have emotive meaning, the aura of favorable, unfavorable uh, feeling that hovers around a word. Example, here was positive, while thief is negative. Uh, and then euphemisms will help to avoid negative feelings, the restroom, instead of the toilet. And that, that's going to change and it's going to make a softer hit. Weasel words, these are words that are going to hey, change things up. And so we'll change from a clear statement and precise statement to something that's vague. Promotes heart health, fights bad breath. It doesn't solve the problem, but it fights it. Supports, again, doesn't solve it, supports, may. All these are weasel words where it doesn't actually solve the issue. It's a little bit of a lie. Uh, other ways to persuade the issues of grammar in the passive voice can cover up responsibility. Villages were bombed. We bombed villages. There's a major difference there. And just like changing the grammar, we change responsibility. And then we can reveal and conceal in that only mentioning desirable parts while not mentioning undesirable parts and concealing them. The idea that, oh, I want you to meet this guy, he's got a great personality. Ooh, that's a red flag there. What do you mean by that? All right, thank you.